So I want to say, uh, what I want to say is, uh, as Magdalena already announced, I want to speak about equivariant elliptic homology. And uh, everything original I want to say today is joint work with David Gebner. And uh, although he's not a co-author on anything uh, I've written or will be writing, I should also mention the name of Jacob Louis here because uh, this idea is really in the background of everything I want to say today. Okay, so before I start about uh, talking about anything equivalent, so I just want to give us a slogan, elliptic homology You can imagine like a higher version. Of K theory. So higher is meant the chromatic uh, picture. So K theory, as many of you know, is chromatically a theory of height one, and elliptic homology theory is a uh, cohomology theory of height two. Um, I will be a little bit more specific about this in a moment, but uh, what I want to say now is, I mean, here you have variations like equivariant K-theory, which deals with vector bundles uh, over G spaces, equivariant vector bundles. And okay, then you might want to do also equivariant elliptic homology. And actually, uh, Grinovsky the year uh, 95, defined equivariant elliptic homology. So then you might ask, uh, what do I still need to talk about when this was already defined in year 95 over the complex numbers? Okay. And uh, for any, everybody having some, say, chromatic interest, you know that certain aspects are lost if you do algebraic topology and characteristic zero. And uh, <laughs> yes. Ah, so one can move it like this when one one it's not allowed to? Is one allowed to move it by hand? But I have just moved it by hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This, uh, this solves this question. Okay. Uh, and there has been a lot of kind of additional work uh, on uh, elliptic homology of the complex numbers by Rochu, by... Uh, by Charles Quesk, by uh, Berwick Evans Tripathy, uh, by Devoto, and many other people who have refined this original definition of Grinovsky, uh, which had, uh, I mean, they were not defined for all compact Lie groups, so had, there were some extensions. Over the years, there were many extensions of this. Okay. So let me do it in a proper way. Okay, so, um, so what were the motivations, uh, what are the motivations uh, behind uh, this picture of equivalent elliptic homology, of elliptic homology? Let me start with something uh, very basic, which goes back much longer than 95. Namely, there's a very basic trichotomy of rational functions to genometric functions and elliptic functions. Yeah. These are ancient and this goes back at least, I think, 200 years or something like this. And uh, so rational functions, well, you can say they are uh, functions on the complex plane, okay? To genometric functions are one periodic functions So they are functions on C 
modulo sum, uh, say, lambda times z, okay? But this is actually the same as c without zero, isomorphic, if I just use the exponential function, uh, this defines an isomorphism. So a trigonometric function can be seen as rational functions on c cross, and as isomorphism. And elliptic uh, functions are two periodic functions. So uh, I have two axes of periodicity, say uh, lambda one plus uh, lambda two. And so what I have here is functions on lambda one plus lambda two times z. So, and this is an elliptic curve. Okay. So topologically, this looks like a torus uh, C uh, model of this lattice. So this uh, three ancient kind of functions can be seen as functions on, on C, C cross, and such an elliptic curve. Okay. So, then I put a uh, further row in this, uh, in this table, and there will be one row in between. Let me write ordinary cohomology. I write K theory. And I write elliptic cohomology. So how can I go from this row to the last row? I mean, there's no direct way to do this, but uh, many of you know that to complex-oriented cohomology theories, one can associate formal groups. And if you look at these three things, these three things have group structures. So they've also associated formal groups. If I kind of tailor expand the group law uh, at the identity. So I could go uh, have this kind of correspondence between these things and these things, if these were not over C, because I don't really want to cancel everything with C here. So as soon as I have integral versions of these, then I could do it here. So let's look at integral versions. So let's say these are complex groups. And these are integral uh, groups. Or I should really say, uh, to be more precise, group schemes. So this is what's called GA, is the additive group. So what does it do? I mean, many of you might not be so happy with schemes, but you can see a scheme just as a functor on commutative rings. So not every such functor is a scheme, but every scheme defines such a functor, and it's completely determined by this. So what does the additive group do? Well, it sends any commutative ring to its underlying additive group. And it turns out the complex points of this, well, are exactly C with the additive group structure. And likewise here, I have the multiplicative group, which sends every R to R, the units here, with the uh, multiplication, and well, this is GM. Uh, and well, one can also define elliptic curves of arbitrary rings, but there's no kind of preferred elliptic curve. Like there are many different lattices here I can take. There are just many different elliptic curves over many different rings. We need a PMSP, right? Yes, thanks. So many, uh, so elliptic, I just write down elliptic curves over arbitrary. commutative rings. So uh, what picture you should have in mind is uh, these are some, some kind of varieties which are defined by cubic equation and over C it would look like this and in general well you cannot really draw what an elliptic curve over FP looks like but you can define it. Okay. And then uh, via passage of formal groups you can go between these things.
So elliptic cohomology theories are complex-oriented cohomology theories whose formal group comes from an elliptic curve. So this is basically a definition. So there are many different types of elliptic cohomology depending on which, uh, which elliptic curve you take. So, but actually, uh, Groinowski was not really an algebraic topology, or as far as I know, still isn't. And uh, so, so he had a different motivation in mind why he was defining equivalent elliptic cohomology. And let me just say a few words about this. So, uh, so it turns out that there is a, in representation theory, he's a, he's a representation theorist. So representation theory, there's a thing which goes about 40 years back. There's something called the Yang-Baxter equation. You don't have to know what it is. But there was a classification of Belavin and Drinfeld, which says, okay, there are three different kinds of solutions, rational, trigonometric, and elliptic. And then they discovered that there are all kind of other objects in, uh, in representation theory, which had corresponding rational, trigonometric, and elliptic versions, like in quantum groups, for example, or in Hecker algebras and stuff like this. And then Kastin, Lustig, and Ginsburg discovered that you can get these algebras construct representation theories by applying equivariant K theory to certain spaces. And some other versions on the rational side you can do by applying ordinary K th ordinary cohomology to certain spaces. And then they asked, okay, if you have such a magic trick, you want to do it again. So you ask these magicians, can you do it again? They do it again. Then you say, can you do it again, but now elliptic? They say, sorry, there's no equivalent elliptic cohomology. We cannot do it. And then Grinovsky stepped in and defined it. And uh, then representation theorists could kind of apply this trick also, equivalent elliptic cohomology to the same spaces and define equivalent kind of elliptic versions of stuff and study their representations. So this, I think, was one of the basic motivations of Grinovsky and taken up by other people later. Okay. So um, what I want to do today is I want to uh, give you a version of equivalent elliptic cohomology, which is defined integrally, not over C. And to do this, I want to just define or construct equivalent K theory in a very particular way, which essentially displays how it depends on GM. And then once we have understood it, we can just say, do the same thing here, just with an elliptic curve. And uh, I should say, uh, I mean, this idea is certainly not originally due to me or David Gebner. This goes way back, I mean, at least to Jacob Lurie's survey of elliptic cohomology. And I think much of this goes back, I mean, particularly to work of Greenlees and Hopkins. Hopkins' work, of course, unpublished. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, one of Greenlees' papers, you see something like, uh, this it was originally worked by, joined with Mike Hopkins, but he declined to be a co-author or something like that. Okay, I mean, there are more motivations, but maybe that's enough uh, to start. Okay, so, uh, so uh, K theory and, and GM. So it's a general thing uh, I've experienced in life many times that if you care about elliptic cohomology or topological model of forms and stuff like this, and you don't understand something, you first have to go back one step to K theory and if you understand in a very peculiar manner, often you can transfer this understanding to the elliptic cohomology. Okay, so what is the uh, equivariant K theory of a point? Well, this is the Grotenik group of equivariant vector bundles on a point. So what's an equivariant vector bundle on a point? Well, it's a complex representation. So this is the Grotenik group Group of finite dimensional uh, complex G representations, which is often denoted by R of G. Okay. So, as this is a conference not only on uh, chromatic homotopy theory and K theory, but also on functors. <laughs> I should tell you what the functoriality in G is. <laughs> I think I didn't have a, I mean, I had the functors on commuted rings, but whatever. So this is functorial. Uh, on the category. Uh, 
op. So uh, what are the objects? Objects are compact Lie groups because I'm scared of other groups. The morphisms are group homomorphisms. And now comes the first point why I put category in quotes. Because uh, secretly, I also have two morphisms. Uh, so what could be the two, uh, two morphisms between two homomorphisms? Well, I could take conjugation. Uh, so if I have H to G, I can choose an element in G and conjugate by this. And this defines the two morphisms here. They could be trivial if the group is abelian, but I still remember them. Okay. And the second lie is in category is this is actually, uh, well, this carries a topology. So, uh, so what I really do is, uh, so really, op is the infinity category associated to the topological uh, two category just defined and uh, to make Victoria happy I can write like this. Okay, so there's a way to define this. I don't want to get into the details, but there's a way to define infinity category from such from this thing. Okay. Um, okay. So, and this is in the spirit of what's sometimes called global homotopy theory, where you let it really vary over all groups. And this, uh, this thing op was, for example, this, uh, uh, discussed by Gebner and Henriquez in an influential preprint, which for some reason still didn't appear. Uh, but there you have to ask a co-author of mine. Okay, so, so now I will draw a big diagram. So we have functor from orb to commutative rings, sending, uh, to make it a little bit, let's see how this color is, g to r of g. And well, it's contravariant, so I better write an op. Okay, so, uh, but now uh, we are, or at least many of us are homotopy theorists here. So we know that commutative rings are just a way to express pi zero uh, of a commutative ring spectrum. I mean, it has other, version, other benefits, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so let's do it, and here, well, this is... Uh, I'm not quite sure what the best notation is, and it's a kind of, essentially it's the, I could call it the fixed points of the equivariant K-theory spectrum. And this is an infinity ring spectrum and pi zero will be exactly this. Okay. Now, um, yes, essentially defining this although I didn't say anything about uh, transfers, and I won't. Okay, so, and if you want to connect this a little bit more, uh, okay, maybe going back to what Ehrlich said, this is something like a global theory, and say you have fixed a G here, and you want to compare it with this. Uh, you can get for every uh, orbit here, for every G mod H, so the orbit category is the category on the G mod H, which G maps between them, you can get an object here, which is the compact Lie group H, but actually I usually don't want to denote it by this because it becomes confusing. I would like to denote it by BH, uh, so the objects are really secretly, I consider them like a classifying stack of H. But if you're not happy about this, you can just ignore the B and just take H as the object here, and then it's also fine. Okay, so this defines a functor like this. So in particular, I get a functor from orb G to this. So, uh, but there's another thing I can do. Sorry, the diagram gets bigger and bigger, but uh, I have my reasons for it. 
um, I can look at G spaces. And there's an old theorem by uh, Tony Elmdorf which says in uh, updated language that if I take functors from this orbit category to spaces, then this is actually equivalent category, infinity category to G spaces. Uh, this is a, a kind of, if I have a G space, I can record for each orbit, I can record the maps from G mod H to this. So in other words, the fixed points. And this is remembering all the fixed points of the G space. And you've put this all together, uh, you remember the whole G space in the correct way we want to. Okay. So, and I have the uh, particular can uh, view G mod H as a G space and have a functor like this. Okay. And now there's a general principle that uh, I can, there's a unique, I can ex I kind of extend any functor from here to here to a functor like this, which is co-limit preserving in a unique way. It's like a process of Kahn extension. Okay, so this means for such a functor, I get automatically a functor from all G spaces to here. Okay. So, uh, so thus, and this can be seen as what equivariant K theory does. So if I have an X here, and uh, say uh, this is a finite GCW, make my life a bit more honest, uh, this goes exactly to K0 or G of X. But note that uh, I really had to go to homotopy theory to make this work because uh, co-limits are just very different if I take them in one category here or in the infinity category. Okay. So the upshot is equivariant K theory is determined by a functor. to infinity rings off. Okay, so uh, now on my mission uh, to kind of re-explore K-theory, I said I somehow have to construct it from GM. And I just said, okay, if you have this functor, you get everything, but I have to explain how you get this functor. And let's just do, let's do, let's do this in two steps. So uh, to understand Uh, the functor from op. Infinity rings op. We have two steps. The first one is G abelian. So, uh, what to do for abelian G? So there's an extremely classical fact which says uh, every irreducible uh, G representation, uh, in this case of a billion G, is one dimensional. I mean, in general, representation theory is a hard subject, even of compact Lie groups, but for abelian compact Lie groups, it's not so complicated because everything, every reducible representation is one dimensional. So if we denote G hat as uh, homomorphisms from G to uh, U1, so this kind of fact we can choose them all to be unitary representations, we see that uh, irreducible representations are, are in bijection with this Pontiagin rule G hat, okay? There's, and if we think about this representation ring G, every, so, Complex representation of G have the cool Schmidt property. Everything decomposes uniquely into irreducibles. So what we really get here is this 
we get for every irreducible, we get a z, where I count how many times I have it, and then I have to take a direct sum over these. So this is the representation ring. And then one can actually upgrade this and get that if we have this, this kg, this E infinity ring, this should be the same as uh, I take K theory, the K theory spectrum, and I smash it with this thing. So, which is just the same as taking the infinite direct sum like this. So it's pi zero will be exactly this, and actually this one is not a way more complicated statement because this is really, the K-theory spectrum is really built from the category of representations by a K-theory machine, and the category of representations is just determined by the one-dimensional representation. You just have to stare at this fact long enough then you see this. Okay. And you might also say this is uh, another way to phrase it would be, it's like a group ring in G hat. So that's good, but uh, still I didn't get to the GM, but it's very close now. Um, so, so uh, above there, I uh, talked about some schemes and I said, okay, just think about it as a functor. There's kind of the most basic functors you can build are just represented by a commutative ring, or more precisely co-represented. You're just mapping out of certain commutative ring, and this we call spec. So uh, we call, or note, GM is the same as spec like this, since uh, we take homomorphisms out of this ring to some R is just the multiplicative group because, well, we can send this to any unit. Okay. And this is the group ring. This looks, looks now a bit awkward, but I write like this. <laughs> and now define GM KU as spec K okay. is on Z. Well, and K is on G, Z, it's the same thing as the Pontryagin dual of the circle group, where T is the circle group. So if you want, it's the same as you want. So uh, homomorphism from this to itself I classify by z, by the winding number essentially, kind of z to the n. And so this is Pontryagin dual. So we see that uh, this, so this is the same as spec the t fixed points. So there we get suddenly the GM in there. So at the moment, this is the definition. And you say, wait, I only talk about spec for commuter rings. Why are you allowed to do this for E infinity rings now? This is slightly cheating. And uh, in the background, I say, okay. Some things in algebraic geometry we can also do in spectral algebraic geometry where we use everywhere just E infinity rings instead of commutative rings. And the formal way I just have been doing this is actually not hard. If you understand what an E infinity ring is, you just say, this is the functor represented by this E infinity ring, and this is now a functor on E infinity rings. I can just define it. If you want to delve deeper into the theory, of course you need more, but then you can read another thousand pages by Louis or something like this, but uh, this is on the formal level this you can just take. And moreover, there's a little, you can do a little computation which shows that spec of the G fixed points, well, but this computation's above there, it's the same as spec of this group ring. It's actually the same as homomorphisms from G hat to, uh, to this thing. Just playing around with some symbols, you can, you can get this. Which may be not surprising from this explicit description here. Okay. So the upshot is, for a Bailey and G, you can get every 
every of this kg by this formula, which is for K theory totally not necessary, but you will see the point in a moment. Okay. Questions about this part? Okay. So, uh, okay. You might say, okay, uh, abelian representation theory for abelian groups is easy, and I just express it in a complicated way. What's the point? But actually, all the information about K theory lies in the abelian part. There's an amazing theorem, uh, so part two, what to do no, to do a non-abelian G. So it's a theorem of Adams. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this guy. Are we Eberle, uh, Yakovsky, or Jakovsky? I'm also not quite sure. Yaskovsky? Okay, thank you. There's always somebody in the audience who's more, well, better informed than you. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the functor uh, op to uh, infinity rings op is left Kahn extended. from uh, orb ab, which is the full, full subcategory of on abelian compact groups. And actually the result is stronger, so actually from from cyclic groups. Topologically cyclic groups, so all tau i would be also in there. Okay. I mean, they don't phrase it exactly like this, but the essence, they prove exactly this statement. Okay. So this means we only have to define the functor on abelian groups, or even on cyclic groups, and then we can just have this magic of Kahn extending. So you have some co-limits. Note that this is an op category, so these co-limits are actually limits of the infinite rings. So, uh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> so you can just compute everything else via some co-limits or limits, at least theoretically. I mean, in practice, this computation can be very hard and actually not very efficient way to do it, but you can define it this way. Why zero is just Yeah, I think so, yes. And I mean, the very basic uh, philosophy behind this is like if you have a representation, they are uh, kind of determined by the characters and characters are essentially like you restrict to cyclic subgroups and see what happens. And this is a much fancied up version of this. Uh, okay, any questions about this? Uh, is this the real point that those have higher derived functors? Yeah, they are higher derived functors. So if it's like, it would be not true if you just have the, on the pi zero level, it would be, I think, just, or I mean, is it, or is it get art into theorem then? I'm not, Yeah, I don't think so, right? It's a good question. It's a good question. I actually don't know. So after this kind of detailed look at K, well, 
I'm not quite sure about the details, but this kind of look on Tay theory, we might have an idea what to do in the elliptic cohomology case. So, so it should be a two uh, a two step uh, process or three step process. So, uh, so first of all, so if Ah, so let me first, so first define a functor on orb app, on the abelian groups, okay? But before we can do this, one has to do one thing, which is absolutely crucial. So here we said, okay, let's start with GM, then we might do this. So we have to fix something replacing GM. So, uh, so fix, so need replacement. For GMKU. And this replacement is fix uh, a nice Spectral elliptic curve. So I won't give you the definition of a spectral elliptic curve, but I already kind of said, okay, believe me that there's something like spectral algebraic geometry, which is based on infinity rings. And uh, I gave you the definition essentially of an elliptic curve of C, the C model lattice. And I said, you can extend it to any commuted ring, then you just have to believe me, you can extend it to every infinity ring. Okay. And nice is that actually some extra structure one needs, which I don't want to mention here. It's called so called orientation. This has something to do with one needs to get the precise functorality in this category orb. This already plays a role here, and I, nobody noticed uh, that uh, you want actually that this thing uh, is functorial not only in homomorphisms of G, but you also want to have the conjugations, and this becomes a little bit annoying to set up. You need some extra structure, but I think it's already complicated now. Okay, so some elliptic curve, let's call it E over some S. S might be an infinity wing or something more general, doesn't matter here. Okay. So, so then define elliptic cohomology of, uh, of some VG where this is, uh, where G is an abelian group as homomorphisms. On the Pontryagin dual into E. So, for example, we might take G to be the circle group, then uh, Pontryagin dual is Z, and homomorphisms from Z, well, they don't change anything. We get that this would be E itself, what we associate to a circle. And uh, let's take another example. Let's take the group with n elements, or a cyclic group with n elements. I guess there are more groups with n elements. Uh, and then turns out the dual is isomorphic to Cn itself again. And then we have uh, the elliptic cohomology here. It's homomorphisms from the cyclic group to E, and these are the n torsion of E. And then if you have a general abelian group, well, this turns out to be product preserving, and so if you say you have a product of two circles, then you get here the product of two elliptic curves, and so on. Okay, 
So this defines, if one does a bit of work in the background, a functor form of app to, yeah, to what actually? Uh, before I had to e infinity rings op, but an elliptic curve, if you look back to the very basic picture of like a compact Riemann surface, this is not an affine scheme in the sense of algebraic geometry. So, well, e infinity rings op would be affine schemes, affine spectral schemes, so I just say spectral schemes, leave out the affine. Okay. That's good. So. No, that's not what I want. Okay, so now uh, we can copy uh, the second step, step two, uh, left can extend. The functor orb app to a functor. on the whole orbit category, the spectral schemes. Okay. So there's actually something subtle here. Uh, first of all, you might ask, well, it's a good definition. Okay, maybe K-theory case convinced you, but there's something more serious happening. So E infinity rings and E infinity rings op are by complete infinity category. So I can can't extend how I like. This is a more geometric category when I talk about schemes, and this is not a co-complete category. So uh, I'm not allowed to just say this unless I write a theorem uh, part one, this can extension exists. And this is not a formal theorem. I mean, this is, I think, in some sense, one of the most difficult things we do in this joint paper uh, is actually showing this because one, yeah, one has to work hard. Uh, and the second thing is, above there, if you see the diagram way above there, there's also the way to extend this to all G spaces. And this is also based on this kind of co-limit extension. So uh, likewise, uh, we get a functor from uh, G spaces to spectral schemes uh, by Kahn extension. And uh, let's say finite GCW complexes here, because else this cannot work. So, why one is true? So at the end, so uh, essentially we do it in several steps. So first of all, we can 
work with different category, which is co-complete, namely something like locally winked spaces. Or this also works with infinity winks, locally infinity wing spaces. There all co-limits just exist. Okay. There we can can't extend, and then we have start computing that we actually get schemes. And then you do a longer computation uh, and show in the case of UN you get a scheme. And actually for every finite comp UN complex you also get a scheme. But then uh, every complex Lie group embeds into some UN and say H embeds into UN and then you work with the final UN complex UN modulo H. It turns out this is the same as the value you would get on, on BH and then you can show it. So they are all not affine. They are all, they are, okay, it's not quite true. For finite groups, you might get something affine. But uh, for, if you have a kind of a positive dimensional complex Lie <coughs> group, so in general, it will always be a projective scheme. And if it's finite, then, okay, then it might be both affine and projective. But usually it will be always be something projective. Okay, further questions? Patience. <laughs> More questions, or were they all the same? <laughs> uh, so that definition is it clear that it recovers the earlier definition or the complex number? Uh, it's yeah, it's it's not clear. <laughs> we earlier this was a theorem, and now yes. We so uh, we have not shown it, but what we can show is that uh, on every let me not lie, at least on every, uh, okay, we'll discuss this later. So we can show something along these lines, but not quite this statement. We maybe could, but we didn't do so, so far. Well, I mean, there's a very specific construction of by Gronowski, and then uh, it's, it's a very different spirit. It's much more concrete, but it, by the very construction, it can only work over the complex numbers, because it really, yeah, it really identifies an elliptic curve over complex numbers with the product of two circles and uses this explicitly. And if you have an elliptic curve over an arbitrary ring, it's really not the product of two circles. Okay. Further questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, let me say this right away. So remark. Uh, ELL is actually uh, can't extend it. From uh, let's call it orb. Uh, let's call it orb app two, which is uh, uh, the full subcategory of orb on all abelians abelian g such that phi zero g needs at most two generators. It's, uh, maybe one can strengthen this slightly, it's kind of in general it's topologically generated by at most two elements, but this is at least close. More questions? Okay. So, uh, so I call it this equivalent elliptic cohomology, um, but you might ask, where's the cohomology? I mean, I associate to everything a scheme. Uh, <laughs> doesn't really sound like cohomology. Uh, you can recover something more classical from this. Um, And I will tell you this before I, uh, I will come to kind of more concrete calculations. <laughs> so, um, Say we have this functor from G spaces 
uh, to respect to schemes, then, uh, well, say we have some spectral scheme X, I can always make a spectrum out of this. I can just send X to the global section of a structure sheaf, if you know what this means. So, and, okay, if I want, I can even go further and then take homotopy groups and go to graded abelian groups. So I get a functor from G spaces, ah, uh, uh, I get a contravariant functor from G spaces to graded abelian groups. So this would be a, would be a quite an equivariant cohomology theory. In classical sense. For example, one allowed choice of an elliptic curve, I said nice elliptic curve, I never specify what I mean, and it's a bit subtle what kind of elliptic curves I can take here. And luckily, Louis has given us a huge supply of such elliptic curve, and uh, there's one elliptic curve which is universal. So I can take E to be the universal, universal. A uh, nice uh, spectral elliptic curve. Uh, this is uh, to Louis that one can take this. There's some subtleties, but just accept that it exists. So then, uh, then uh, this equivariant cohomology theory is an equivariant refinement. TMF. So. so uh it's a or well, more precisely like a genuine equivalent refinement. So it's not like so for every spectrum you can always define equivalent cohomology theory, so-called Borel equivalent cohomology theory. This is not what this is, but this in some sense approximates Borel equivalent cohomology. Borel equivalent cohomology theory on BG would be just I have TMF star of BG of the space BG. It's not what it is, but in some sense it approximates it. Okay. So, but I could also, if I wanted to, I could also do something like uh, there's a, if I have some level structure here, TMF3 or something like this, I K to localize, I will get like a Lubin Tate theory. I get also a genuine equivalent refinement of Lubin Tate theory by this. All capital, yes. Yeah. Else I don't know how to do this. But this is a, it's a very good question. If, I, if someone can do it for connective TMF, this would be really, really good. But I can't. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, let me spend the last uh, six minutes, I guess, about uh, telling you about uh, computations. And uh, although, I mean, I uh, wrote it with a capital C, it's not really computation with a capital C, uh, in the sense some other people do it here. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so the classic theorem in K theory, or I mean, not really a representation theorem, representation theory, that uh, if G is uh, connected, Compact Lie group, and T, and G is the maximal torus. For people who don't know what this means, it's really like a torus inside G, which is maximal under inclusion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, W is the Weyl group. Uh, and what is the Weyl group? It's uh, 
I take everything uh, which normalizes T, so every element in G was conjugate, conjugating T lens in T again, and then I quotient out by T, which was this is a boring element which do this. Okay, so uh, then this was this long setup. Then, uh, the representation ring of G is isomorphic to, I take the representation ring of T, the Y group is acting on this, on T by conjugation, and I just take the fixed points. It's a very beautiful theorem because uh, representation theory of torus, well, I just, for single circle I told you, I just have the Laurent polynomials in one variable. And now if I have a product of circles, I just take Laurent polynomials in several variables, and I just take the fixed points. So e.g., uh, uh, for un, the Weyl group is a symmetric group, and then uh, what I get is uh, I have the raw polynomials in n variables, and I take sigma n fixed point, and you can make this more explicit. It's a very powerful theorem. So what you essentially get, uh, you can compute it that you get uh, every uh, representation of un. You have topological un representation, n-dimensional one, and uh, well, you can take the exterior powers of this, and uh, representation ring is generated by this, and the top exterior power should be invertible because it's one-dimensional. So this is uh, so. Then I guess you get n polynomial variables, and and uh, you have to invert one element if you make this computation explicit. So and then the theorem, uh, which. Uh, They've get now and I proved. So assume two things. First of all, an assumption on G. So G is connected, but I need something slightly stronger. Maybe pi 1 G is torsion free. For example, if simply connected, so you might have in mind UN or spin N or stuff like this, SPN. And the second thing is uh, uh, bad primes are invertible on E. I will comment on the bad primes in a moment. Uh, then uh, the underlying scheme of the uh, underlying scheme ELL BG, which is often denoted by a heart uh, uh, of ELL BG, is isomorphic to uh, take ELL of the maximal torus underlying and quotient by the Weyl group. And uh, this is really a quotient in, in schemes. So and if you, uh, for an FN scheme, what does a quotient do? Quotient by group, spec of R, then I take spec of the fixed points of R. So you see, if I take spec of this, I will get exactly the result that spec of these are the quotient of spec of R of T modulo W. So this is, in some sense, the precise analog of this. And actually, uh, maybe I don't write it because time is running. Uh, you also get in these cases, sorry, the water is dropping there. Uh, uh, so uh, you get also in this case that uh, the structure sheaf, if the structure sheaf, if your elliptic curve was even periodic, which it usually is, then you also get that the structure sheaf on this uh, ELLBG is even periodic. So you can control this pretty well. So in particular, Particular if we take ELL of B U N, well the maximal torus is n dimensional, so we have E to the N uh, 
and divide out by the sigma n, so it's like the nth symmetric power of E. And uh, these bad primes, uh, so, uh, so bad primes for UN uh, don't exist. Uh, so this is uh, true without inverting anything. But for example, for uh, bad primes for spin, spin n would be the prime two. And then for different Lie groups, you get different sets of bad primes. We didn't really explicitly calculate for everything because, I mean, I'm not sure whether I ever have tried to work with the root system of E8 or something like this, and I refuse to do it. So we haven't really uh, explicitly calculated this set. But if you, for example, if you compute, kind of invert all the, uh, the Weil group, uh, the, the order of the Weil group would be okay. And, uh, but for spin n, it's better, for example, just to do this. And in particular, if we work over C, then our bad primes are inverted, and we get this calculation there, and this agrees with the calculation which in Groinowski's work is by construction. So in this sense, you get an agreement, uh, but uh, then of course you have to identify the functors precisely and stuff like this, and we really didn't do this. So I don't want to claim anything. Okay, I think on this note, I want to end. Thank you very much. Um, so we didn't really explore this for all groups, but one certainly all has to be careful uh, what one actually gets. So for abelian groups, there's a version of the TS Siegel completion built into the theory in a sense. So uh, that what one gets, for example, if one takes a circle group, which is I think the most basic case, um, that if you have the elliptic curve uh, and uh, you compare it to what happens with it, uh, elliptic homology of BT, the space BT, you complete at the unit section. But it turns out if you take a global section, so you really get a classical equivalent homology theory, it's not at all co uh, completion. Because uh, elliptic homology of BT, well, it's a, you have the power series in one variable, and turns out the equivariant, the circle equivariant homology of a point, in this sense, would be just you have the base plus a once shifted base. So it's finite dimensional. This is a general. Uh, thing which de kind of coming from this, this everything is projective here that uh, for example this the fix the G fixed point of TMF will all be compact TMF modules all be perfect TMF modules which is a noted contrast to have what happens K theory so you cannot have an Acidia Siegel completion on that uh, theorem on this level. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I haven't specifically checked, but I think the Tate curve is allowed as a nice spectral elliptic curve. So you get a theory of the Tate curve. And, and is that some kind of deformation of the K theory? Yeah, so um, I think in some sense you should see K theory in there, but uh, it's a bit troublesome because if you, let me, let me think. Uh, so, yeah, so. Um, yeah, so you might be able to comp compare it in some way. I mean, the, the nicest thing would be, so there's this thing done kind of by, by I think Charles Ruesca's word on this, and then uh, Jean Wan, I think is her name, this quasi-elliptic homology, which is a very explicit model of this equivariant, kind of Tate equivariant elliptic homology. Noah Gunter also did something. Uh, and it would be very good to kind of explicitly say that this, what we get here, is some completion of what they are doing. And, but this is something we, it's a bit, a bit tricky to show, but uh, would be nice to get. I mean, that's kind of an analog of the churn type. It's, it's kind of, you know, one step down would be the churn type. Yes. Like yes, it's kind of, uh, yeah. I think today one says it's transchromatic. It's like going from height two to height one, yes. Yes, be great.
Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yes, so, uh, so, so when I say uh, for every, <laughs> so every, every G space I get a spectral scheme, but uh, so say I have some, so I already called this X, so what was a good name for, so F, for every G space X, the, I have a canonical map to a point. And so if I take uh, ELLG of W, this maps to ELLG of a point, which is just the same of ELL, what I earlier called also ELLBG. Okay? So for every, this, can I always push forward the structure sheaf to there? So the sheafy version would be I have a functor from G spaces to sheaves on this thing. And uh, this is a nice stable category. So in some sense, this would be the correct version uh, to take without taking. And then if I want, I can take trouble sections, but I really don't have to, and maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, this is already saying roughly like something like this because uh, I mean, what is a divisor? It's something like. But there's a there's a more precise statement which says that actually without taking the heart, actually we show that uh, this is uh, Hilbert the length n Hilbert uh, spectral scheme uh, of E over S. So this is the UN case, the only one where we actually identify this as a spectral scheme, not just the underlying one. And this is actually true. And I think, yeah. I mean, it would be great to have also things for like sigma n, like kind of kind of building a version of your result for more of a E theory. Uh, but yeah, this uh, we didn't manage yet. <laughs> compact Lie group, connected compact Lie groups are somehow simpler than the finite groups. 